When it comes to training and diet, most of us realize that, for the most part, shortcuts either don't exist or aren't worth taking over the long term. However, when it comes to the squat, there are four science-based things you can start doing right away that'll have a near immediate impact on your strength, regardless of experience level. Now, I'm gonna skip most of the basic stuff you've probably already heard before, like you should squat more frequently. Squatting two to three times per week usually is the sweet spot. You should squat earlier in the workout when you're fresher and make sure you're eating enough calories and protein. These are all very important tips, but I wanna focus on strategies you may not have considered before. Okay, so my first strategy is to prime your nervous system for a big squat by using acclimating drills like walkouts and pin squats. Now, when I say prime your nervous system, there's nothing spooky going on. You're simply preparing your brain and nervous system to get used to firing under heavy loads. This sort of works like when you shoot a weighted training ball and then the normal basketball feels much lighter afterward. So for heavy walkouts, load up 95 to 105% of your one rep max, walk the weight out, brace as you normally would, and then walk it back in without actually squatting it. Now, if you're new to walkouts, start with weight you've actually done first, and then work your way up to supra maximal loads slightly above your current squat max. And it's smart to set the safeties higher than usual just in case, and still use a spotter if you have one. And if you hit these once or twice a month before your planned squat work for the day, not only will it make those later sets feel even lighter, it'll get you more confident and familiarize your upper back and stabilizers with what it feels like to support some heavy weight. Another variation that's helpful is the pin squat, where you set the bar on the safety pins at the bottom and start with a concentric phase. This can be extremely helpful for lifters, myself included, who get intimidated by the fact that the traditional squat starts with the lowering phase. You can contrast this with a deadlift, where if you don't lift the weight, it just stays on the ground. No big deal. But it's very common for even experienced lifters to worry that they'll be able to unrack and lower the weight just fine, but then get buckled under a failed positive. So by setting the bar up on the pins, you start the movement with the positive and finish with the negative, which can eliminate that fear of lowering the bar and not being able to get back up. And a cool progression with these is to set the pins at about half squat depth and then gradually lower the pin height over time until you get to parallel or just below. So if you're new to pin squats, I'd recommend starting with something around 65 to 75% of your one rep max for four to six reps if doing them to parallel. But if you set the pins higher, you can load much closer to your max and then progressively lower the pins from there. So if your lack of confidence in your squat is holding you back, it will help to pick one of these drills and do it once every couple weeks or so. Okay, the second strategy is to fine tune your ideal squat technique. Many of us get locked into one way of squatting simply because it's how we first learned to squat, but you'll be able to put up bigger numbers much faster with a simple fine tuning of three aspects of your form. The bar position, your squat depth, and your stance width. We'll start with bar position. According to a poll of my own audience, only about a quarter of you squat low bar. That's despite the fact that most people are five to 10% stronger with the low bar position. In fact, a 2017 study comparing the two variations found that the low bar back squat is a more efficient way of squatting large loads. However, there was an influence of expertise, meaning there may be an adjustment period for the low bar squat where you need to get used to the technique first before you see the strength boost. Now, in case you're not sure about the differences between high bar and low bar, I'll put a table up here that you can pause and read, but the main difference is that you simply shift the bar down a couple inches further on your back. That's about it. This shift will cause you to lean slightly more forward as you squat, but the bar should still travel in a perfectly straight line over the middle of your foot. Also, I thought about this and that poll could be a bit skewed because in my Squat Technique Tuesday video, I demo the high bar squat and I do tend to slightly favor it for hypertrophy because it allows you to achieve a similar muscular stimulus with lighter loads. However, if your goal is to get your squat numbers up, it's a no brainer to at least give low bar a try. Most people are stronger with it. Now, this also doesn't mean that you should permanently switch to low bar exclusively. Like me, you can use a combination of high bar and low bar variations concurrently, squatting low bar for heavy top set work and high bar for some of the paused technique and hypertrophy work. These variations should help make you a more well-rounded lifter anyway. Next, you wanna optimize your squat depth. And when it comes to squat depth, there are two schools of thought that can both work. So it's important to try out both and pick the one that works better for you. The first school of thought is to intentionally cut your depth to just what's needed for your goal. 
The thought here is that since less depth means less range of motion, all else equal, you should be able to move more weight if you limit depth within reason. So if you're squatting for powerlifting, you do need to get the hip crease below the knee joint, but there's no point in wasting energy going any deeper than this. If your goal is general strength and size, you only need to go to parallel or just below parallel. And again, going deeper is just wasted energy. However, the second school of thought is that you should squat as deep as you comfortably can to maximize the bounce that you get out of the hole, formerly known as the stretch shortening cycle. Now, as a lifter, I personally fall more in this latter camp. I find that whenever I squat with the intention of limiting depth, I actually end up being weaker. But as a coach, I do recognize that this is highly individual. So you should absolutely experiment and find the ideal depth for you. People with good ankle mobility will usually squat more by going deeper and getting the bounce, and people with less ankle mobility will usually squat more by cutting depth to the minimum required amount. The last aspect of technique we'll fine tune is stance width. Now, if you currently squat with a shoulder width or just outside shoulder width stance, next time you squat, go about two inches wider on each side and flare your toes out slightly more. According to a mammoth of an article by Greg Knuckles, a wider stance lets you hit the stretch reflex we just talked about without going unnecessarily deep, increases adductor involvement, and makes the lift easier on your back. Collectively, these things should allow most people to squat more weight with a slightly wider stance. However, everyone's anthropometry is different, so it might not work for you. Still, as a lifetime narrow stance squatter myself, this is something I'm gonna experiment with over the coming months. Okay, my third strategy is to learn to use your training gear better or consider investing in some if you don't have any. Of course, you don't need any gym gear to put up impressive squat numbers, but there are three items with pretty solid empirical support that I'd recommend. First, a belt. Now, if you already have a belt, it's important to remember that a belt isn't a passive tool. You're not using it to get lazy in your bracing, you're wearing it to enable your body to work harder and smarter. And so you'll get a lot more out of your belt if you actively brace against it by breathing down into the belt before you descend as you push your midsection out in a 360 degree manner rather than only inflating your gut from the front. This will create a more solid, rigid column of support, reducing energy leaks during the squat. And don't worry, research repeatedly shows that belts don't actually reduce core activation, contrary to popular belief. If I had to guess, I'd say most people will see about a 5% boost from wearing a belt, especially once you learn how to use it optimally. So if you currently squat 405 pounds, a good belt should take you to 425 pretty quickly. Knee sleeves are a bit more optional, but seem to work by bunching up behind the knees, allowing for a bit of extra spring out of the bottom. They also add a feeling of comfort and stability, which can reduce the perception of difficulty at the same loads, allowing you to tolerate more volume. In my coaching experience, they seem to give about a two to 5% absolute strength boost, a figure supported by a brand new study covered in a recent issue of the Mass Research Review. Lastly, using a shoe with a solid sole will increase stability and force transfer much better than a running shoe with a squishy sole. If you're on a limited budget, I'd recommend at least using a pair of Chuck Taylors or Vans. And if you have limited ankle mobility and struggle reaching depth, it might be worth investing in a heeled squat shoe, although this is more a matter of personal preference. I'll also leave some recommendations for all three down below, including affiliate links to some Rise gym gear if you wanna take your squat game up a notch or two and support my work here on the channel in the process. All right, my fourth and final strategy is that you need to set reasonably regular weight PRs or rep PRs in your training. And how often you should be setting new personal records depends entirely on how advanced you are as a lifter. So we'll break this up into three levels. As a novice or detrained lifter in your first six months of training or retraining, you should be setting new PRs pretty much every session. In this case, you should pick a single rep target, like five reps, and simply aim to add five pounds to your squat every week. If you were to actually stick to this every week, it'd translate to over 100 pounds on your squat in less than six months. This is called linear single progression, where you're keeping the sets and reps the same and just hitting these minimum five pound PRs every week in a linear fashion. Once you get to a point where the sets feel really grindy or you're not able to maintain good form while adding weight, it's most likely time to move on to a more advanced progression. So once you hit the beginner to intermediate stage, you can start using linear double progression. And this can work also if you're more advanced, but have been less structured with your programming. So here you'll pick a narrow rep range, say four to five reps, and alternate between adding one rep and adding some weight from week to week. So for example, in week one, you do three sets of four reps with 200 pounds. In week two, you add one rep, still with 200 pounds. In week three, you add some weight, but go back to four reps. And then in week four, you add a rep again. So now you're doing five reps with 205 pounds. 
So you're still progressing linearly, but weight PRs are being set only every other week now. And then once you reach the intermediate to advanced stage, PRs will be less frequent again, and progress will be much less linear, but you still need to set some kind of PR with some regularity for continued progress. This can be something as simple as hitting weight and reps that you've done before, but with less exertion or with better technique. For example, in my intermediate to advanced power building program, you work up to a near PR weight or an actual PR weight for a top set every second week. Now, exactly how heavy you go is auto-regulated, but these sets are meant to serve as signposts that you're moving in the right direction along the way. Then at the end of the 10-week program, you perform a max test with the goal of setting a new PR. So depending on just how advanced you are, this could mean that you're setting new PRs for a given rep count every other week, or simply approaching PRs every other week and then hitting a new max at the end of the 10-week block. Either way, the point is that as you get more advanced, you still need to have these regular, but necessarily less frequent signposts in your training, confirming that you are in fact still trending in the right direction. Okay, so guys, if you're looking to put all this information together into an actionable routine, I recommend checking out my 10 week power building program on my website. If you're an experienced trainee looking to take your size and strength gains up a notch, or you can check out my fundamentals program if you're still in your first year or two of lifting. My power building program has been easily my most successful program to date, and I've never seen so many people add such impressive numbers to their lifts in just 10 weeks. And I'll link more info about each of those programs in the description box down below. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one.